Today, I want to talk about student e-portfolios. Hello, my name is Benjamin Stewart at BenjaminLStewart.net. And before we get into today's topic, if you have any thoughts, insights, or experiences using e-portfolios in your own teaching practice, feel free to reach out to me on my Twitter handle at B-N-L-E-E-Z. Today, I want to talk about e-portfolios, and I'd like to talk about uh, e-portfolios specifically as it relates to English language teacher trainers. And uh, this semester, I have some students who are going to be asked to include some artifacts, some things that they complete in class and an e-portfolio. But today's discussion really is to all students in the BA thinking about how each of you can create your own e-portfolio, something that you can contribute to and maintain throughout your stay at the, the university. And as you get into the profession, something that you can continue adding to as you gain knowledge, experience, and as you change professionally, as you become more uh, competent as an English language teacher, uh, having an e-portfolio is a good place to have uh, or to host the different artifacts that demonstrate your, your competencies. So today I want to talk about how to develop an e-portfolio, the why, the what, the, the how, give some examples uh, at the end of today's discussion so you can see uh, some prior student e-portfolios. But the first question is why? Why include or why even spend time developing an e-portfolio? Think of the e-portfolio as being personal and professional in that each one of you will have one e-portfolio that you maintain and you will want to include artifacts, learning objects, things that you can complete, maybe they're audios or videos or documents, presentations, that you will add to this one e-portfolio, as opposed to maybe having various e-portfolios in different classes, you'll maintain one space, one e-portfolio, and bring all of the, that content in from your different classes. So why create an e-portfolio? Think about when you graduate or maybe you're uh, applying for a job, you're going to have a, a resume that's going to have your experience, your educational experience, your professional experience, and other information. But having an e-portfolio is a good way to complement the resume. A lot of times the resume doesn't show or demonstrate certain knowledge in different areas. And an e-portfolio is a good way to, to do that. Now, this is an e-portfolio in the sense that it's going to be online. So it's going to be a public, uh, public document. It's going to be in a public space. So the idea is going to be that anyone can access this information. So always keep that in mind whenever you're uploading information there so that uh, you feel very comfortable with the type of content that you're sharing in your e-portfolio. Uh, let's say if a, uh, a director or coordinator wants to access this information to see whether or not to hire you for, for a job, for a teaching job, for example. So an e-portfolio is a way to present your knowledge, your, your understandings, your skill sets, your attitudes, disposition, your values. Right? This is a, also a space that can show... And ed, or it can be a place where you can show in it your educational philosophy. You can share your educational philosophy in your e-portfolio in terms of your overall vision for uh, teaching and learning. So again, the target audience for an e-portfolio, a director or a school coordinator, maybe a committee that is, has been chosen to select students for an exchange program, or of course it could be for those cases where maybe you want to study a more advanced degree. So in educational philosophy, this is something to uh, include in an e-portfolio. It's always good to have an educational philosophy, something that expresses why you teach, whom do you teach, what and how uh, are you going to teach or do you teach, and uh, where do you want to teach, and think about also the technologies, what kind of technologies you might be using to include in your own teaching practice. Think of 
the following questions when you're considering an educational philosophy, when you're thinking about what to include. Number one, what do you believe is the grander purpose of education in society and the community? Try to think beyond the actual school setting, what kind of impact will you have as an educator, as an instructor on society? Number two, what specifically is your role as, as, an, as an English language instructor? Number three, how do you believe students learn best? Number four, in general, what are your goals for your students? And those goals could be not only goals that are curricular in nature, but could expand and to beyond the, the actual school experience. Question number five, what qualities do you believe an effective teacher should have? Number six, do you believe that all students can learn? So how or why? Number seven, what do teachers owe their students? Or what do you as an, as an instructor owe your students? Number eight, what is your overall goal as, as a professional, as a teacher? Number nine, how do you create an inclusive learning environment? A learning environment where all students are participating or engaged and all students are getting the most out of the educative experience. And question number 10, how do you incorporate new techniques and activities and types of learning into your own teaching? These are some guiding questions to, to consider. Maybe you don't include answers to all of these questions, but it serves as a guide in, in, into what you can include in your own educational philosophy. So what to include in your ePortfolio and how can you organize this information? So because we're focused on English language teaching, I'd like to break down your, the types of content that you might include in your ePortfolio based on, uh, based on an, an English language teacher, based on what the types of classes that you typically take uh, in the BA. So number one, think of you as a communicator of English. Think of what kind of evidence could you include in any portfolio that would demonstrate this skill, your English language skill, your abilities to communicate. Number two, think of including in your e-portfolio anything that relates to your knowledge of applied linguistics, your knowledge of how languages are learned. Now, this might include courses that you took uh, let's say in uh, linguistics, discourse analysis, psycholinguistics, uh, social linguistics. You also have a course called Applied Linguistics, but anything that you create in those courses might be best to organize in a category that, that shows your ability and your knowledge and understanding of how languages are learned. Number three, teaching methodology. So your understanding of teaching methodology, anything that you create, maybe it's a presentation, an audio or video, anything that you create that demonstrates your understanding of teaching methodology could also be included in and organized in an uh, e-portfolio. And number four, teaching practicum. Anything that you complete in your courses that you uh, create, maybe it's an audio or video, maybe it's a lesson plan. These are the different types of artifacts that you could include that relate to your experiences in, uh, in your teaching practicum. So when you're updating and your e-portfolio, you're uploading this information, you can include, of course, the artifact itself, the, the file, the document, but you could also name these documents. You could also include the subject where you completed this particular activity. Um, you could also include a, a rationale. You could offer a reflection to complement that, that particular artifact. Maybe you talk about what you learned, some challenges that you overcame to complete the task. These are all good. Uh, alternatives, not alternatives, but good information to include along with the artifact to show how you uh, grew from that experience. It's not always about including the best 
work. It's not always about only including those things that you think show uh, a high level of understanding or skill set. It could also be something that you struggled with that you're proud of, but maybe it's not uh, the best work, but because you're sharing your reflection, you're also showing how you learned or what you learned from that experience. And this is also very valuable when you're creating an e-portfolio, because again, it's to show good work in some cases, but it could also be a space where you're really demonstrating your learning process and, and how much you've, you've learned. Now, when you're thinking about dividing up your e-portfolio or organizing your e-portfolio, we can think in terms of standards based on the four categories that we just mentioned. So taking standard number one, skill development in English communication, these are all examples of how you could do this, but one way you could do it is divide it into speaking and writing. Since speaking and writing are the two productive skills, this could be one way that you share or organize your content. And the idea with speaking and writing, you're also, in a sense, showing your level of uh, how you use grammar, vocabulary, pronunciation. So the other domains are there as well. Listening, of course, listening and reading could also be included or organized uh, in a way that maybe shows certain strategies that you're using for those uh, receptive skills. So it's really up to you how you want to divide this up. You want to divide it up into the four different skills or simply two broad categories, speaking and writing. This is a, an individual choice, but try to think about some subcategories that are best applicable to uh, the standard being a communicator of, in English. Standard number two, applied linguistics. As I mentioned before, you might think in terms of grammar, phonology, Eng English literature. You can think of the different courses that you've taken throughout the BA. Uh, that would be uh, linguistics, social linguistics, psycholinguistics, discourse analysis, and the course itself, applied linguistics. So again, you have some options here. Some of your decisions will need to be uh, related to how languages are learned and what would be the best way to organize this information into subcategories under this one area. Standard number three, teaching methodology. Now, this could also uh, be divided into uh, areas that I mentioned earlier, right? There could be some categories that have some commonalities or even have uh, some of the teaching methodologies that apply to uh, the, the ways that the languages are learned. You could mix those, or you could have a separate section for teaching methodology broken down by learning theory, behaviorism, cognitivism, constructivism, connectivism, social cultural theory, many different uh, theories that you're going to be learning about. And so you can divide up some of the artifacts that you create in some of your classes by learning theory. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that you only include learning theories that maybe uh, relate to your teaching practice. This is, again, a way for you to demonstrate your understanding of these teaching methodologies, regardless if those teaching methodologies are ones that you subscribe to, ones that you use in your own practice. This is, again, a way for you to demonstrate your understanding of a wide range of teaching meth methodologies. Standard number four, teaching practice or practicum. Uh, this might uh, be a way for you to separate, let's say, based on age, if you have some, some experiences, you have some types of artifacts that you create and some classes that you've recorded that relate maybe to children versus other uh, experiences or recordings of classes that relate more to uh, as, as for, for adults. You could divide up you know, those types of uh, situations. If you are into games, you have some experiences teaching using games and maybe others where students are working in small groups or in pairs or whole groups. Try to think of certain categories that, that make sense as it relates to 
the teaching practicum, the different experiences that you had, and try to organize your ePortfolio accordingly. All right, so just um, to review, there are many different types of artifacts, different things to include in ePortfolio, and I have a list here that you might want to go through. I'm not going to go through the entire list at this point, but most ePortfolios is going to have some kind of cover page or preface, preface, and you will want to, of course, include uh, your name and some other personal information. Remember that this is a public space, so you're not going to want to share any personal information that you don't feel comfortable sharing. For example, you probably do not want to share your telephone number. You probably do not want to share your address, your email. Now, this might be information that you include in a resume because you'll be personally delivering a resume to the school. It's not a public document, but the ePortfolio is a public document. So be very selective and be very careful in what you share to the world and, and, and uh, what you keep private. So the different types of artifacts, again, maybe something related to knowledge of the subject matter, knowledge of human development and learning, how you adapt instruction for individual needs, maybe multiple instructional strategies, classroom motivation and management skills, and so on. I have a list here. I think it's worth going through this list as you're going through and thinking about the different uh, categories and types of artifacts that you're going to include in your own ePortfolio. Also, go through here and see how you can also categorize your artifacts more specifically referring to this list. All right, now the, and the next question that you'll probably need to think about is where do you want to host your ePortfolio? Now, this is something that changes of, as technology changes. Uh, we have to really consider where to host our ePortfolio, a place where it's likely to be around for a while. So Google Sites, for example, uh, because it's backed by Google, then we are fairly certain that it's going to be around for, for some time. Uh, Wix, Weebly, WordPress, these are other online spaces that I feel have been around for a while that uh, will probably be around in the future. Notion.so is relatively new, but it, it is a good option in terms of functionality, in terms of how to create an ePortfolio. Notion.so might be a good option, but it hasn't been around as long as these uh, other options. Now, just to give you an example, Wikispaces used to be around. It used to be a, uh, a recommended space for creating an ePortfolio, but this is one example where Wikispaces is no longer around doesn't exist. And so this is a risk. This is something that you need to put some thought into so that, again, you can be fairly assured that the information, the content that you're including in your ePortfolio is going to be around. And uh, it's uh, definitely something to think about. Of course, another decision will be that you choose a space that you're comfortable working in that you find it easy to add content, it's easy to manipulate and move and organize the content. And so this is also another very uh, important characteristic or decision that you need to make is choose a platform that you know how to use, that you feel comfortable using. Maybe there's a learning curve in the beginning to figure out how to move things around. But again, uh, it's important that you choose an option, a platform that you feel comfortable using. This is something we'll talk about specifically in uh, classes that I have with students, but generally speaking, try to choose uh, a, a online hosting space, taking these two things into consideration. One, that it'll be around for a while, and two, that you, uh, you can navigate around fairly easily. Now, because of the content in your ePortfolio is going to be made, uh, made public, it's a good idea to have some kind of understanding of Creative Commons. So a Creative Commons, you need to think of it in 
two different perspectives. One being information that you share that belongs to someone else. Someone else created it and you want to include it in your own uh, e-portfolio. Okay, so that's one way, one perspective. The other perspective is the content that you're creating, that you're sharing publicly. You too will want to license that under a Creative Commons license so that someone else, if they want to use it, they will have to pay attribution to you. So Creative Commons license is a license that simply means that if you use someone else's content and it's under a Creative Commons license that you will need to pay attribution. You will need to give credit to that person to say this content belongs to this person, provide a link so that uh, the the uh, they can go to that content. They know where to find it. And you'll also want to include the type of license, the type, type of Creative Commons license that it falls under. Now, I'm not going to go into the different types of Creative Commons uh, licenses that currently exist. This is something we can talk about on a case-by-case -case basis. If you're in my class or if, or if you're a BA student and just have a question about Creative Commons, we can certainly discuss that. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, but, but generally speaking, the idea would be to be fairly consistent with the type of Creative Commons license. Uh, be consistent in the type of license that you use in your e-portfolio. So if you're going to use a CCBY, the most open type of license, then most of the content, in fact, all the content probably should be under that same type of license and information that you create will also need to be under that same kind of uh, license, the CCBY. Um, so again, I don't want to go into, uh, get into the details here, but uh, we can talk about this uh, privately if you have some questions, but just be very careful that if you upload an image, an audio, a video, anything that's not your content, anything that you did not create, make sure that you only use Creative Commons license. And there are many ways that you can do this, but I use DuckDuckGo. When I search, um, when I try to search content, I use what's called a bang with an exclamation mark, CC for Creative Commons. And let's say I want to look for, let's say images of trees. This will take me, uh, in this case, to WordPress org and it takes me to an open verse and these are images presumably we have to check each one to make sure but the idea here is that we're only getting results in this case images that are under the creative commons license and you can you can uh, put your cursor over some of these images and see at a glance what type of creative commons license it is this would be the most open CC by. These are different CC by uh, non commercial, right? And share alike. So, so, yeah, this is one way that you can search. If you go into Google, uh, you can also filter your search and select images here. And then tools, and then Creative Commons license. So here we have a filter using Google Images, using the tools Creative Commons. We're going to filter that. So again, presumably these images all fall, fall under a Creative Commons license. We still want to do our due diligence, making sure that we're checking each image. If you're using an image, we want to double check that it is in fact using a, a license that, uh, that we can use, right? So this is, this is how I just double checked this particular license just by clicking here. Th these are the steps that you'll need to go through whenever you're looking for images. Of course, it's the same process if you're using or including videos and, um, videos and, uh, just different documents. All right. So creative commons, uh, make sure you're, you're being careful with the type of information that you're including in your public document, your e-portfolio. Finally, here in this uh, presentation that I'm sharing with you, I have some examples of different uh, student uh, of different uh, student e-portfolios in the past. So, if you want to get some ideas, 
they're very individualized. Uh, they're very different. And that's the idea that you go in and use and create your own space, your own color scheme, making sure that, um, that the information is organized, that it can be easily read, and that you can easily go through and see uh, the different content when someone is going in that they can easily find what they're looking for. So uh, these are some uh, considerations when you're thinking about developing your own ePortfolio. Those of you who have had experiences with ePortfolios or if you have any additional insights, feel free to reach out to me at my Twitter handle at B-N-L-E-E-Z. Today, we talked about ePortfolios. Those of you who are taking class with me will be talking about this at length in class. Even if we, you're not asked to include an ePortfolio as a, as, a, as a requirement of the subject, hopefully today I've given you some ideas on ways to maybe think about creating your own ePortfolio and keeping uh, track of all of the, the things that you're doing. You can be selective. You don't need to include every single assignment, every single document that you, that you have done, but do try to include some information each semester as you progress so that when you graduate from the BA, you can look back and have a wide range of evidence of what you understand, what you know, what you can do, your values, disposition, your attitudes, and have that available whenever you go look for a job along with your resume so that you're getting the most out of your learning journey and uh, hopefully will allow you to, to get uh, the jobs that you're, that you're wanting. All right, so my name is Benjamin Stewart at BenjaminLStewart.net. Thanks for listening.